Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Jay, for the introduction. So as you mentioned, I'm Diogo, and today I'll be presenting LAA BFT, uh, which is work developed at IST and in ESC in Lisbon. So LAA is a Byzantine fault tolerant, an asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant state machine application protocol. And since this is quite a mouthful, I'll also start by breaking this down. So state machine application is this fundamental primitive in distributed systems that allows a set of replicas to behave as a single consistent state machine, which in turn allows those replicas to provide a single logical service to clients. So the protocol is said to be Byzantine fault tolerant if it is able to tolerate arbitrary deviations in a subset of the replicas. It turns out that this is quite an old problem. It was first proposed and solved by Lamport in the early 80s. Uh, however, for the first two decades, it didn't get much attention, partly because all solutions were rather unpractical. At the turn of the century, Miguel Castro and Barbara Liskov published PBFT, which seems to be the first practical solution for the problem. Um, however, it does, it does get some attention, but it quickly fades off as well, mostly because um, there's no, there were no real use cases for that at the time. Um, and this is more or less the set of things up until um, 2010 and the dawn of cryptocurrencies, which is a big turning point for, for BFT. And as you certainly know, blockchain technology is very much popular nowadays. And because these systems are usually deployed in a very distributed and adversarial setting, BFT was found to be a perfect fit for them. And for these reasons, um, the appearance of Bitcoin and later on Ethereum really drove research into scalable, robust, and performant protocols uh, performance solutions for the state machine application pro problem under the Byzantine fault model. And it's in this context that a lot of recent proposals have appeared, um, most notably maybe Algorand, which is really the first cryptocurrency to explicitly use consensus, and also Hot Stuff and QBFT, which are two protocols that are deployed in, in real world blockchains. And whenever one designs such a, a consensus protocol, he or she must eventually face the FOP impossibility which states that it's impossible to achieve consensus in an asynchronous deterministic system, even with a single crash fault. And except for the cryptocurrencies that use proof of work with very weak guarantees, or protocols I've mentioned so far, usually just use partial synchrony to circumvent the impossibility. And this in practice means assuming a bound on transmission delay and using timeouts to guarantee liveness. However, it's usually very hard to configure these timeouts. If you set them too small, then they will keep firing. It's very hard to make any progress. And if you set them too big, then the overall system is very susceptible to a single crash degrading performance. So the alternative way to circumvent impossibility is to use randomized protocols instead of deterministic ones. And now we finally can get full asynchrony, meaning no timeouts. And the protocol performance will just usually follow network performance. And the current trend is towards these asynchronous and randomized protocols, because for the reasons I mentioned, they are usually more robust and does a better fit for blockchains. And fortunately, in parallel to the line of research I've just shown you, there's been a line of research into these fully asynchronous protocols that started in the 80s with Benor and Braca's work and, was followed, and has seen a recent series of practical proposals, yeah. starting with maybe Henny Badger and followed by the Dumbo family of protocols and other protocols that have appeared since. And we think that these um, asynchronous protocols usually classify into two families. We have the very first generation, which were very elegant protocols, but that were also usually very inefficient. And then we have the most recent series of proposals that are very efficient protocols, but that are also uh, usually very complex. And should we care about this complexity? Should we try to make protocols simpler? And I would say that yes, especially if we care about, about adoption in real world. Um, some people perceive BFT as this overly complex topic and um, might even think of BFT talks like, such as these as something like this. And it's not only a matter of perception, obviously. It's, it has practical consequences as well. If protocols are too complex, and it's, first of all, it's hard to reason about, and it has, it's hard to prove its, its correctness. And secondly, it's harder to implement, which hinders adoption. Um, so, of course, there are many reasons that affect adoption, but it seems that simplicity is a key feature. And an illustrative example of how important simple and elegant protocols are uh, is QBFT. This is a protocol that was proposed when the field was already rather mature, and it did not completely outperform its competitors. And despite this, it can still be found in a lot of real-world systems, such as Hyperledger Bezu, Protocol Labs, SSU Network, Quorum, and the list goes on. So our goal was to design an asynchronous protocol that was both performant, but also simple to, to, make, to try to increase the odds of, of reaching the real world. So, so how do we do it? 
to understand how, how we reach our final design, it's, it's good to start with the, the existing protocols, the existing asynchronous protocols, which include more or less uh, Honey Badger and the Dumbo family. Uh, just to recap, we'll have clients submitting transactions that I'll deplete as these little fruits here. And the overall goal is for replicas to talk to each other and find some total order in which to execute these transactions. Um, and these, these protocols usually moved in rounds. And at the start of each round, uh, replicas would use a broadcast primitive to tell each other about the transactions they want to execute. However, this primitive usually isn't perfect, and for that reason, some disagreement situations, such as the one you see here on the slides, might arise. Uh, here, the, the leftmost replicas didn't see the banana, and they don't know if it's because the broadcast is slow or if the broadcast didn't uh, end at all, or, wo or won't end at all. And, and for this reason, the, by the time that replicas need to start agreeing on what to, to deliver, there might be different views on the set of outstanding proposals. And the intuition is, since the system is asynchronous, we can't have leaders because we can't have timeouts to change it if no progress is being made. And for that reason, we'll need a more complex agreement protocol that will allow us to find the subset of replicas, of transactions rather, than that everyone agrees to deliver. And this architecture usually makes protocols a bit more wasteful because up to F transactions might be discarded. Also, it's a bit harder to ensure uh, censorship resilience. More importantly, because replicas need to be ready for proposals from anyone, a more complex agreement step is required. So to solve this, we bring back a key insight from classical partially synchronous protocols, which is to have a per request designated leader replica that is, that is responsible for driving the protocol execution for each request. And this will allow us to have a simpler uh, agreement component. At the high level, we'll still have the diverging views problem, but the big difference is that in each round, we'll have a designated leader that is responsible for driving the protocol execution and that is proposing a transaction. And now replicas will have a much simpler decision, which is just to vote yes or no based on whether they accept the current leader's proposal or not. And then this leader will be rotated in a round robin fashion. In this case, for example, the banana may, might be rejected. More concretely, we'll need to have two components that will run in parallel. We have a broadcast component that will allow replicas to, to tell each other about the transactions they want to execute. And then we'll have an agreement component where replicas will agree on whether to deliver the current leader's proposal. And then we'll need some sort of glue to put these, these two pieces together. So this glue will be a set of n queues. Each replica will have n local queues. And QQI will store proposals from nodes i. Then we'll have the two components running uh, side by side. First, the, component, the broadcast component will work as follows. When a replica receives a transaction from a client, it will just broadcast it into a given slot. But then when that broadcast delivers a, at a given replica, the replica just needs to take that transaction and add it to the appropriate queue in the appropriate slot. Um, in parallel, we have the agreement component that, as I mentioned, will uh, move in rounds. And each round will have a leader. And the only thing the replicas need to do is look at leader's queue and look at its head and check if there's a transaction there. If there's something there, they'll vote yes, otherwise they'll vote no. If yes wins the voting, everyone will just deliver the head or execute the head. So I need to mention that except for the specification of the priority queues in, in the middle and of two black boxes that are needed and of a recovery protocol, this is, is essentially it. Okay? And as you can see, it's, it's very simple. So let's take a look at it in action. Suppose the transaction reaches um, replica one here, the transaction will go into the broadcast component, it will be broadcasted to everyone else, and upon delivery, it will be added to the queue. Um, now, what do we need from this green box here? We'll use a specific variant that is called verifiable consistent broadcast that needs to fulfill five properties. The last two are a bit of a technicality, so I'll, I'll skip them because they're not relevant um, at this point. The first one, validity, means that if a correct replica broadcasts the transaction, then all correct replicas will eventually deliver the transaction. Consistency means that if a correct replica delivers M and another correct replica delivers M prime, then M must equal M prime. And finally, we'll need verifiability. And this means that if a correct replica delivers M for a given broadcast instance, it is able to construct a proof that M is the correct output and so that proof to other uh, correct replicas that haven't delivered and make them deliver M for that broadcast instance. In parallel to the broadcast component, we'll have an agreement component uh, running that will go round robin around the queues. 
Uh, let's suppose it, we start with Q0. Here, there's nothing at the head, so everyone will use this red binary agreement box to vote, and everyone will vote no. The output will obviously be no. And then we'll move to the next queue. Here, there's something there. Because of the previous broadcast, the, everyone will vote yes, the output will be yes, and the transaction is delivered. So again, what do we need from this uh, red box here? We'll use a specific variant called a synchronous binary agreement that needs to fulfill five, uh, three properties. Sorry. And the first two are the standard ones, so I'll skip them again. Um, the most important one is here validity that says that if the output is B for a given instance, that at least one correct replica inputted B in the first place. And this is important for two reasons. On the one hand, this means that the Byzantine guys can by themselves stop the protocol from making progress. And on the other hand, this means that if the output is one, then there's at least one correct replica that has a transaction and can send that transaction along to, with the proof to every other replica that is behind. Um, for, this, for this purpose, there's a, specially, a special recovery mechanism described in the paper in, in greater detail. Uh, before wrapping up this part, I just need to mention that um, the protocol complexity, uh, the broadcast component and the recovery are linear in the number of replicas. The agreement component is quadratic, it's round, and we might have up to sigma rounds before the transaction is delivered. So the overall complexity is sigma m squared. Aleo was implemented first in a research prototype in Java, and since then it has been integrated into the MIR framework, which is intended to be a new consensus layer for Filecoin subnets. Um, it has also been integrated into distributed validator technology at SSV network, and implementation is currently underway at OBOL. Before moving on, I just want to give you a bit of detail regarding these last two deployments. So as you might know, um, Early cryptocurrencies used proof of work to, to achieve consensus. However, this decision ended up with Bitcoin spending more energy than some countries. And for this reason, um, Ethereum, which was a proof of work crypto, moved to a new consensus engine, which is proof of stake. And in proof of stake, each node, also called validator, must take tokens to be able to participate in decisions. And to ensure good behavior, um, bad behavior is penalized. And here, bad behavior uh, ranges from lack of liveness to explicit Byzantine behavior. And on the one hand, this is very good because it does enforce good behavior, and it's good for the environment. And on, but on the other hand, it, is a, it creates a high barrier to entry for individual people, and it's also a big risk for individual nodes, which end up, ends up in practice incentivizing centralization of decision power. And the solution is actually quite simple. Instead of having a validator be a single node, we'll just get a set of nodes and form a distributed validator. And this does solve the problems I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and the key here is that um, obviously implementation is not trivial, but at its core we'll need consensus or state machine replication to make sure that the set of nodes that make up the validator behave as a single consistent validator, avoiding slashing for, for inconsistencies. Um, the three implementations I mentioned earlier were, were benchmarked. Um, first, the research prototype was benchmarked against Honey Badger and Dumbo NG, which is a state of the art protocol. Here on the slides, you can see peak throughput and base latency for varying network conditions. Um, the key takeaway that are, is are that we, we achieve comparable throughput, and, but we get a big re reduce in, in, in latency, mostly because instead of a more complex multi-valid agreement, we use a simpler binary agreement instance for which we found some optimizations that um, really reduce latency. These are described in, in greater detail in the paper. Um, next, the, the distributed validator technology was benchmarked against the existing baseline, which at the time uh, was QBFT. Um, here on the slides, you can see a crash trace where one of the replicas is crashed at the 10 second mark. And this was benchmarked for varying cryptography choices. Uh, as you can see, the throughput is better regardless of the cryptography we use. But for the better choice of cryptography, we achieve uh, a big improvement on, late, on throughput. Sorry. Uh, finally, the MIR implementation was um, benchmarked again against the existing baseline, which was ISS with PBFT. And here on the slides on the bottom, you can see a crash trace where one of the replicas is crashed at the 150 second mark. Um, as you can see, the synchronous protocol uh, degrades much more gracefully than the partially syn synchronous counterpart, because the partially synchronous needs to wait for a timeout bef before being able to recover its throughput. So in summary, we proposed a BFT, which is an asynchronous BFT protocol that combines simplicity with performance by bringing back a key insight from classical protocols. Um, the benchmark so that it has good performance and it most importantly is being adopted in the real world. Thank you.